The Lone Ranger is a character that Hollywood can just never get right. In 2013, they tried making a film about it, which turned out to be one of the biggest box office bombs of all time, on top of being critically panned and earning a lot of controversy for casting Johnny Depp in the role of a Native American. That movie was boring, slow, and extremely long. And yet, as it turns out, there's an even worse Lone Ranger film lying in the Hollywood cesspool archives. Ho 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 ho! Delightfully devilish, Seymour. <laughs> Yes everybody, welcome back to Delightfully Devilish, the show where we discuss films that all at once meet the criteria of being the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm your host Jukebox Harry, and today we're going to be talking about one of the most boring pieces of shit I have ever discussed on this show. Now a film that's boring doesn't necessarily meet the criteria of being Delightfully Devilish, but this is a movie which actually has a production story which is so much more interesting than the film itself that I just had to talk about it. The Legend of the Lone Ranger is a 1981 western film directed by William A. Fraker in the last film of his directorial career, and it stars Clinton Spilsbury, that's a name you should probably remember remember because it's that weird, but the reason you don't remember it is because this is the only film he ever actually appeared in. The man was cast in this film because the studio was hoping by casting an unknown actor they could achieve the same success that the Salkinds did when they cast the relatively unknown Christopher Reeve in the Superman films back in 1978. But while Superman proved to be a huge box office phenomenon and catapulted Christopher Reeve to fame, this movie bombed so hard and the actor has never appeared in anything else. As a matter of fact, in his single film role, Clinton Spilsbury went on to win the Golden Raspberry Awards for both Worst New Star and Worst Actor. And quite Quite frankly, he definitely deserved both of them. The Lone Ranger originated as a 1930s radio show and then a book series, but it found its biggest degree of success as a 1940s western TV series starring actor Clayton Moore. Unfortunately, the producers on The Legend of the Lone Ranger decided to stir up a lot of negative publicity for their film because they decided to take out a court order preventing Clayton Moore from making public appearances as the character, which he would do at county fairs, state fairs, and children's hospitals. So yeah, they decided to just shit on a guy who was just trying to do a good thing. And on top of that, the western genre was not popular at all at that time because the year prior, Heaven's Gate became one of the biggest box office bombs in film history. So with all that going wrong, what could they get on this film right? In the end, very little as it turns out. The Legend of the Lone Ranger starts in Texas where a Native American child is being chased by cowboys. He gets helped by a young white child who discovers that his house is going up in flames because those same cowboys are accosting his family. The entire intro plays out with a very classic western movie feeling and a lot of spectacular cinematography. Director William A. Fraker has been nominated five times for the Academy Award for Best Cinematography so it's not hard to see why he has an eye for imagery, but it might give you the false impression that this film is actually going to be good. The cowboys kill the child's mother so the Native American child who we learn as Tonto brings him to his people's reservations where he get some spiritual advice which could not more obviously be dubbed. Though we cannot see those that are dear to us, does not mean they are no longer with us. Keep your parents alive within you and their spirits will never die. He had to struggle with strange customs and his own fears from within. He learned the wisdom of the forest. He learned the ways of the wind. God damn, I feel like I'm listening to that song Convoy right now. The rhyming voiceover narration sums up the upbringing of this child with the Native Americans until his brother rocks up. Oh, I knew you'd come. That's what she said. You're gonna go stay with Aunt Martha in Detroit. Why did you say that, Dad? The child makes a blood pact with Tonto. You will always be Kimosabi. The Native American child has literally no charisma when he speaks. I should feel something, but I don't. Also, this film never actually explains the relevance of the name Kimasabi. It actually was very much popularized by the original Lone Ranger TV series and has some degree of meaning, but this film never explains what it is. After the film's intro credits, we see a group of well-dressed individuals preparing to journey to Del Rio in a carriage. Need help? Wow, okay, that didn't sound right. John. John Reed. Thank you, Mr. Reed. She's a wonderful writer, isn't she? Are you familiar with her? Well, actually, I prefer Century of Dishonor. I haven't read it. Well, you should. Yeah, so the story here is that the filmmakers were so disappointed in Clinton Spilsbury's performance that they actually had all of his dialogue dubbed by actor James Keach during post-production, and it could not be more obvious. His voice does not match the character's face, his facial expressions never sync up with what he is saying, and it's extremely obvious that he's been dubbed, because when everyone else's dialogue sounds so natural, you can tell pretty fast how Spilsbury took home two Golden Raspberry Awards. You're a man of vision, sir. It honestly sounds like you can hear the echoes and reverberation in the room where the dubbing was done. That immediately derails the character. I will never take a single thing he says seriously from here. I'm an attorney. I'm starting my practice. A lawyer? <laughs> what the hell was that? You know what it is, bitch. 
During the journey, the carriage comes under fire, and during the chase, we get some of the best shots in the film, which illuminate the beautiful scenery of Monument Valley. The shootout drags on for a while, and several casualties are experienced. Reed steps up to slow down the carriage, and once everything is stopped, he helps disable the attackers. Then they reach Del Rio. Del Rio was a town in trouble. A town with a gun in its back. Plagued by crimes that just wouldn't stop and cursed with a sheriff who wore black. Yeah, this guy frequently pops up to provide exposition and he does it with a jumpy spirit, but the film way too often actually uses this in place of real storytelling. They wore the gray hood, Sheriff. Cavendish gang. Amy told me what you did. I just can't thank you enough. Boy, if anything happened to her... Uh, is there an end to that sentence? John goes to visit his brother, Ranger Captain Dan Reed, who is played by the father of Chandler from Friends. John, I got enough hurt in my life without having to worry about you too. When I was 10 years old, you sent me away to learn. And I learned. But the most important thing I learned was that I belong here. You don't understand. It's still a frontier. It forces you to make sacrifices. We're the last of the reeds. You're my brother. Just doesn't even try to hide the very obvious exposition. You don't belong here. My gut tells me that I'm gonna stay. And my gut tells me that I shouldn't. That only make it safe out here. That just may be impossible. Well, first of all, through God, all things are possible, so jot that down. Dan warns John about the dangers of the Cavendish gang. Butch Cavendish. Butch for butcher. Major in Union Army. Dishonorably discharged. Great court martial right after the Battle of Chattanooga. Now he's heading an outlaw army in Texas. You gonna see him when he comes out here? Cavendish? Grant. He's the President of the United States. Can you go one scene without saying a line that's just not shameless exposition? I don't want to talk about it anymore. Good. Butch Cavendish is portrayed by a pre-Back to the Future Christopher Lloyd, and he's a man who keeps the sheriff wrapped around his finger. Well, it seems to me, sir, that they just... they just did what most men would have done. I have no room for ordinary men, Mr. Wyatt. We are on a course that will alter the history of this country. He has the robbers executed for doing a poor job and getting caught. Then there's a party scene which just drags on. I have a feeling you're going to be a very important lawyer. I doubt it! And the Cavendish gang performs another robbery, but after this first shot, the rest of it actually happens completely off screen. John, his brother, and a few other cowboys pursue the gang. Yeah, get used to hearing that one violin piece from the musical score because they use it so goddamn many times and it honestly becomes quite jarring. This is the first time I've ever seen a movie where the musical score itself actually hinders the quality of the film. And luckily enough, the film did actually take home the now defunct Golden Raspberry Award for worst musical score, so there you go. After a ridiculously long period of them searching, the Cavendish gang ambushes them and a shootout occurs. Even though this scene is actually one of the film's better moments, the long way to get there has blunted any dramatic impact it might have. Everyone gets killed except for John, who is simply left for dead, and the cheesy ballad narration kicks back in. One thing about that Cavendish, he knew how to set a trap. And he finished off the Rangers that day in Bryant's Gap. The entire film takes itself way too seriously, but the narration in these scenes is a lot more campy. If the film actually committed itself to having a tongue-in-cheek tone, then it would be a lot more of a fun experience. But instead, the entire film feels like a very by-the-numbers western movie. And I love a good western, but the market has been oversaturated with these films since the 1930s, so by the 1980s, you need to come up with some fresh ideas and a new perspective, which this film simply just does not have. Tonto finds John and nurses him back to health, bringing him to his reservation again. You see the suffering and the misery they bring to your people? Yet you bring one to us to nurse back to health? Tonto, why? Nobody has reason to fill their hearts with hatred for the white man more than I. He's taken from me my wife and my child. But the man I brought here is my brother. And I will protect his life with my own if I have to. Yeah, Michael Horst matches Clinton Spilsbury as being an equally uncharismatic lead. At least he had all his dialogue said by himself, and at least the studio had the decency to cast an actual Native American in this film as opposed to the Johnny Depp film. But still, he's not one who can elevate the script beyond its mediocre roots. And this point in the film is actually the low point, because it doesn't get any more boring than in these scenes. The next 15 minutes are a long drag as Reed is trained to be a warrior. There is no emotional core to it, no meaningful characterization given to the relationship between Tonto and Reed. And when Reed is trying to tame Silver the horse, the film mistakes the use of slow motion for actual dramatic storytelling and overuses it. 
The biggest sin in The Legend of the Lone Ranger is that it is flat out boring and slow like the Dallas Western movies. It's not even until 58 minutes into the film that our hero actually dons the iconic Lone Ranger mask, which producer Lou Grade believes hurt the film. In retrospect, he felt that they should have told the first hour of this film's story in the first 10 minutes and then got on with the action way earlier. That's a change I would have definitely supported, but it's not something the makers of the 2013 Lone Ranger film were even able to learn from because he didn't even don his mask until 53 minutes into the film, which itself was two and a half hours long. Cavendish uncovers his plan to attack the president's train carriage. The Lone Ranger and Tonto return to town to investigate, but after interrogating a man, the Ranger disappears and Tonto gets arrested. I don't guess anyone stopped to ask what Tonto was guilty of. That didn't stop him from wanting to see him swinging high above. They're just about to hang a guy. Now is not the time to sing a fucking ballad, alright, convoy? The Lone Ranger shoots him free and knocks the guns out of everyone's hands before riding with Tonto to safety. And that's it. There's no stakes, no dangers, or no signs of pursuit. He just rides free. And then the film begins to set up the final action scene. After spending so much time waiting for John Reed to actually become the Lone Ranger, the film itself doesn't even have the decency to show him going through the trials and tribulations that would characterize him as becoming such a great Western hero. We're just suddenly expected to believe that Reed is ready to take on anything. Whatever, Cavendish's men start jumping onto the train carrying President Ulysses S. Grant, played by two-time Oscar winner Jason Robards. And the gang is able to separate Grant's carriage from the rest of the train and thus kidnap him. But then we move to another location, so this isn't even the final action scene yet. The Lone Ranger and Tonto head to Butcher's hideout where he explains his plan to the president. Let it be known that I, Major Bartholomew Cavendish, firmly resolved to hold the President of the United States as my prisoner until I am deeded sovereign right of ownership to the lands of Texas specified in this document. And as they sneak in, there is no tension in the entire scene. And the action doesn't even actually kick off until the next day after they've found the President. When there is literally only 10 minutes left in the film, a series of explosions go off which level most of Cavendish's property. So goddamn many explosions, as in an improbable quantity considering that there were just three men with a collection of dynamite sticks. They blow up the gate too, which leads the US Army in, thus entirely contradicting the film's title as being about a supposed Lone Ranger. It all ends with a scattered shootout where it's difficult to tell who are the heroes and who are the villains, but most of the time the Lone Ranger is nowhere to be seen. He eventually becomes relevant again when he changes Cavendish out of the compound and the two end up in an unimpressive fist fight. And this is the final action scene in the film. This, right here. And even after everything, he can't even bring himself to execute the guy. The president thanks him and Tonto. Please allow me to remain anonymous. I respect your dedication. And I will honor your request. Tonto, I thank you, and I salute you. Thank me by honoring your treaties with my people. Yes, we will try. Do, or do not. There is no try. He gives the president a silver bullet for no apparent reason. They write off the end. Is the- Nope! Before I even get into analyzing this film, I want to say that my brief recount of this movie with all these scenes is actually phenomenally better than watching the movie itself. By cutting out all the ridiculous talky dialogue and trimming the movie down, I actually make it seem a whole lot better than it really is. This is one of the most long, slow, boring western pieces of shit I've ever seen in my life. And remember, I've seen both Paint Your Wagon and Heaven's Gate. In my recount of the film, one thing I barely mentioned was the romantic subplot between John Reed and the Catherine Zeta-Jones lookalike. That's because it adds literally nothing to the story. It doesn't impact John Reed as a person, he never actually reflects on his relationship with her, there are no stakes with it at all, and after a brief conversation in the church at the end of the story, when he's disguised himself as a priest and inexplicably gives her a silver bullet, that is the last of their interaction. Seriously, you could actually cut all these scenes from the film and it would make things a lot better, it would speed up the pacing, but this relationship is not the only thing which adds nothing to the movie. John Reed is given no identity in the film, outside of being a lawyer who happens to later become a ranger. His relationship with his brother and Tonto are thoroughly undeveloped, and Clinton Spilsbury is never given any scenes to flesh out the character as an individual. Maybe they originally filmed more scenes with him, but the sheer disappointment of his acting led to them being cut. And really, it makes me wonder why they ever cast the guy in the first place. He's a terrible lead, and you can tell by his facial expressions that he never internalizes any of his lines. Even without the dubbing, you can tell that he's been miscast. Apparently they cast him because they wanted to replicate the success of Superman, and simply because he looked good in the mask, but he apparently also proved to be a massive menace on the set. He behaved like a diva, he demanded script rewrites, he also demanded the schedule of the film's production be changed to suit his own personal needs. He also apparently got banned from two local bars, once for assaulting a waitress and once for interfering with a band that was giving a live performance and for throwing a drink across the room. So this man couldn't act, nor could he behave himself, so he was never destined for a career in Hollywood. The last time anyone's heard of him since 1989 was when media outlets saw him in 2013 to comment on the release of the new Lone Ranger film. Apparently he's working as a photographer in Los Angeles now, but he doesn't want to talk to the media at all. The only actors in this 
film worth boasting about are Jason Robards, who is perfectly suitable, and Christopher Lloyd, who I don't believe has ever actually given a bad performance. He has delivered solid villainous performances in films like I'm Not a Serial Killer and Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, which is actually my favourite of the Star Trek films based on the original series. He is a great villain, and this film is no exception to that. My dream is to become a filmmaker, and honestly, one day I would love to make a great Western film, so if I was given the chance to make a Lone Ranger movie, what would I change? First of all, I would completely restructure the story. I would make it so that he is already the Lone Ranger, but we get a sense of what made him into the Lone Ranger through flashbacks at essential moments in the story when he comes into conflict with people from his past. Like in Tim Burton's Batman, where Bruce Wayne is already Batman, but when he runs into Jack Fisk and that reminds him of how he became Batman in the first place, that's what we learn about his backstory. Also, I keep the exciting Western action scenes, but it make the tone of the film a lot more tongue-in-cheek. Give it a sense of campy jingoism, like in the original Superman films, although with better pacing, more action, and a greater degree of focus on characterization. Most importantly, I would really give audiences a sense of what John Reed goes through as he develops into becoming the Lone Ranger. Seeing him attempt one or two other missions before taking on the antagonist would show him triumphing over adversity and learning from his mistakes, thus showing how he must grow and change things about himself when challenged. This film made the mistake of being segmented into three very obvious acts, which are as follows. John Reed is left for dead. John Reed becomes the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger does one mission. And there's nothing entertaining about it and nothing much in between. Rather than just being a by the numbers western film without any emphasis on characterization or the theme of vengeance, my film would actually be about the Lone Ranger and not just a 98 minute trailer for another Lone Ranger movie. The few good things I can say about this film stem down to its visuals. William A. Fraker might not know how to work with the actors, but when it comes to cinematography he knows exactly what he's doing. This film has great camera work, beautiful scenery, solid production design and great costumes. Even though it's short on action, the shootouts are decent, but their main problem is that they don't have any mood because of the other storytelling flaws. Realistically, this film is a visual experience in search of an interesting story, just like Heaven's Gate was. And unfortunately, all the beautiful imagery in this film was just wasted on a mediocre narrative. The Legend of the Lone Ranger gets two silver bullets out of ten. It has a couple of moments of visual grace, but like the worst western movies, it is long, slow, boring, bereft of character development, and it's also burdened by all the shortcomings of a highly miscast leading man. And that does it for today's episode of Delightfully Devilish, you guys. If there are any movies you want to see me discuss on this show, please leave them in the comment section below. If you want to see more episodes of this show, please hit that subscribe button. Otherwise, until next time, I've been your host, Jukebox Harry. Hi-ho, Silver.